Hey everybody, welcome to Ontario Nazarene's YouTube channel. My name is Lauren and I'm one of the pastors here at Ontario Nazarene. Thanks so much for checking us out today. We believe that you are not here by accident and that you have been created on purpose for a purpose. And we wanna help you discover what that is and what that means for your life. And so we have a special message just for you today. So sit back, enjoy, and if you'd like to know more about how to connect with us here at Ontario Nazarene, stay tuned to find out more at the end of the message. Well, last Sunday, I uh, began a series of messages entitled, When Death Was Scared to Death. And that all is all about Easter Sunday, that, that death has been defeated. And we use this door, we use this door uh, to talk about the fact that for some people, death simply means this. It's a dead end. I come to the end, I die, life's really over at this point uh, permanently. I just kind of go into a, a mist, nothing really happens with me, and the only thing that's left is my memories, and if we know over time, those will fade away too. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that the door is not closed. It is not a dead end. That death is all about an entry into the presence of God. And so today, as I stand on the threshold, today and next Sunday, we're going to talk more about this side of eternity than this side. This side's very important, and we'll talk some a little bit. But we're going to spend some time over here. What, what happens? What happens one minute after you die, where do we go? What goes on? It, it, in my experience as pastor, I have sensed that we try, we attempt to insulate ourselves with death. We don't want to deal with it very much. We try to do everything we can to avoid it. I mean, think of all the diet and fitness programs we have today, right? Or, well, don't raise your hand. How many of us have wills? and are planning for what happens when we die. We don't want to talk about that. That's kind of, well, kind of creepy. I don't want to deal with that. It, it's as if we believe that death is going to happen for everybody else, but not for me. It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate idea of living in denial. We have interesting rituals around death. Uh, sometimes people put stuff in the casket uh, to, for, the next, for the person to take with them as if like the Egyptians were, they put it in Pharaoh's cave as if they're going to use it in the afterlife. So I read the story about a woman who took two aerosol cans of adhesive and put it in her husband's casket. You see, he had a toupee and she was deeply afraid at some point the adhesive that she had on was going to wear off and he was going to need it. So, you know, spray it, put it on, you know, after you're gone. Well, here's the problem. The story doesn't end there. Um, somehow, the mortician didn't pick up that those aerosol cans of adhesive were in the casket, and he was being cremated. And when they put it in the crematory, let's just say that the crematory door was damaged in the process as it blew up. We will do all kinds of things in dealing with death. But what happens one minute after we die? Let me be clear with you as we look at Scripture today. Let me put this quote on the board for you. Life after death is assured, but the details are shrouded in mystery. There's some mystery. Over the next two Sundays, I will talk about that. But in this series, uh, I want, this morning, I want us to take a 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you, or if you have your phones or your tablets that you're following along. Uh, the church in Corinth has been questioning the authority of Paul. And uh, Paul has been defending himself as an apostle of Jesus. And he will say that there's, matter of fact, one of the reasons he is so adamant about sharing the gospel and willing to suffer for his faith is because he believes adamantly in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and there's life beyond that threshold. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, we're gonna actually start at chapter 4, verse 7 for a moment. We'll move our way into it. He talks about what happens on the other side. He's pretty clear about that there's something out there. Some of it's a mystery. If you would, let's pick up at chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul writes, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from ourselves. 
Go down to verse 16. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. Anybody feel that when they look in the mirror each morning? There, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Paul says that we live in jars of clay, and you've probably heard me say before, I don't think it's really just jars of clay, it's really crackpots, right? Everybody over 60 says, yeah, amen, that's how we feel at times, right? But we have this body in jars of clay. Now that that metaphor goes all the way back to creation. Where that comes from is that when God created humanity, when God created Adam, it says he created him out of the dust of the ground, jar of clay. And he breathes into him his spirit, his ruah, his breath. And so body and spirit are one. I want you to remember that. It becomes pretty significant as we begin to look at resurrection and what that means for us. Body and spirit are one. And then we know what happens in chapter 3 of Genesis. The fall of humanity. Sin comes into the world. Death comes into the world. And suddenly this body begins to enter into decay. And death, the idea of death, has multiple meanings to it. Death can mean physical death. So the idea is that another metaphor that Paul uses other than jars of clay is that we're like tents. He says our body is like a tent. Well, what do we know about tents? Tents are flimsy. So you take a tent, some of you have been camping, you pull out your tent, you get ready to set it up, you pull out those wonderful poles, and one of them breaks. You feel like it's all done at that point, don't you? Or you take some string, look for a tree, and find out some weird way you can hang that thing up so you can sleep in it, because tents were never meant to last forever, right? And when it comes to our bodies... The moment you and I were conceived, the body starts to decay, and it starts heading toward that door. It starts heading toward death. So there is this physical death, but the Bible also tells us there's a spiritual death. There's this separation that happens because of sin. Uh, You know that Adam and Eve were removed from the garden and from the direct presence of God because of sin. And we notice in Genesis 3 that guilt and shame enters in. And Adam and Eve want to cover up that guilt and shame. And we try to do the same. But God longs to set us free from that guilt and shame and that spiritual separation. And that's what the death and resurrection of Christ was all about. And then there's relational death relationship with God, but also, you ever find it kind of tense to get along with one another? Ever find that to be a problem? Yeah, there's relational death that can take place, all because sin enters into the world. So there's two truths I want you to get across about creation. One is that death is an enemy. It was not part of God's desire. It was never part of the plan. Death is the enemy. Matter of fact, if you go into 1 Corinthians 15, there is these rhetorical questions that Paul makes after the idea of the resurrection. He says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? He's quoting Old Testament because death has been defeated. That's the great news. And the issue truly is, if you go back to creation, we were created for eternity. We were created forever. Our souls were created to be around forever. But what does eternity look like? What does it look once we cross over the threshold? What's on the other side? Paul gives us a glimpse. 
It's just a glimpse. But take a look, if you would, chapter 5, verses 2 through 8. Paul says, Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. He's talking about that tent and that permanent building that he refers to. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we're in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up in life. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who's given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. That's the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident. Would you highlight that word in your Bible? We are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are, say that next word with me, we are yeah, we're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, in the King James, verse 8 would read, we are absent from the body. We long to be absent from the body, but to be present with the Lord. The idea that we come into his presence. Now, this is where things could get a little crazy. So I want you to stay with me. I may, we're going to jump into the deep end of the pool. And, and I may rock your world a little bit. But I want you to be thinking about some things when we look at this life that God has for us that is eternal in nature. So stay with me. The Jewish people believed in a bodily resurrection. Okay? A body, it, it, it is a Greek ideology that separates body and spirit. And, and in some ways, we live in this today to think that, well, you know, I can, as long as I've made things right with God, it doesn't matter how I live into this. I can just go do what I want. That is, a, that is not a biblical ideology. That is not a biblical theology. In, in Scripture, we can see the body and soul um, are one. An example of that would be when Jesus is dealing with Lazarus. Okay, he's dealing with Lazarus, and Martha comes up, and they're having this conversation, and, and Jesus talks to Martha about being able that Lazarus will be resurrected, and what does, what does she say? Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Things will come together. There's this moment that is coming. The Jewish people believed that there was going to come a time when there would be a universal resurrection. The whole idea that one would resurrect first in Christ, that was not that the Messiah would do that, not on their mind. There'd be a universal resurrection, and God would restore everything that entailed both body and spirit. Remember, go back to creation. Body, spirit are one. That's the idea. When we die... Here's where I may rock your world a bit. When we die, we are not experiencing the final resurrected life. The terms resurrection, the last day, the second coming of Christ, those terms are different than the idea of going to heaven. The bodily resurrection, when the graves are open, is when Christ comes back and he restores everything new. Paul seems to indicate that there is this intermediate state when we die. And our body may be lying in a grave, and it doesn't matter whether it's a, it's a casket or an urn, okay? So let me just highlight, let me, let me solve that theological fear for you, whatever. Whether it's a casket, God, God has the ability to make bodies out of dirt. So. But that there's an intermediate state that when we die right now, we go immediately to be in the presence of Christ, what many of us would call heaven. But it's not our final destination. Now, some people, matter of fact, it's retur- referred to in Scripture, would call this paradise, where we go to. And we hear Jesus use those words. You might remember a story. There's, when Jesus was on the cross, there are, there's a thief on his left and a thief on his right. And, and if you read some of the gospel accounts, you'll find out that these two thieves start mocking Jesus, and they're making fun of him. And aren't you who you, I thought you were the, get us off of here, take us off these crosses if you are who you say you are. And we don't know when it happens, but I think it's when this one particular thief on the cross hears Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they've done. His, something changes for him in that moment. And, and he says to Jesus, Jesus, 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you. Would you say the next word with me? Today. Today. Right now. In that moment. You will be with me where? Paradise. The word for paradise can mean garden. So let me take you back to Eden. The idea of a place where there is this peace and presence and joy of the Lord. We go directly into that. Now, I've had a number of people over the years who have asked me, what is my friend or spouse doing in heaven right now? What are they doing? Um, I've heard people say at funerals and such, you know, if they loved basketball, well, they're up playing basketball in heaven. They're playing basketball together. Or if they like to play golf, oh, man, they're driving 400 yards. It's a beautiful day. Or if they're playing an instrument, they, their, their notes are dead on, no pun intended. But if you're going to ask me what happens, what's going on on the other side in paradise, Paul doesn't answer that question. Scripture doesn't answer that question. That's part of the mystery. But I do want you to notice that chapter 5, verse 6, and chapter 5, verse 8, Paul uses the word confident. He is not questioning life after death. He simply isn't giving us the clarity of what it looks like. So rest assured that your loved one who has been following Jesus, that they've, if they have experienced his grace, they are with Christ right now. To explain this this perspective that we go into this intermediate state. I like the way Dr. N.T. Wright, and as a matter of fact, he's written a great book. Resurrection is not, let me give the quote and I'll tell you the book. Resurrection is not life after death. It is life after life after death. That's resurrection. He's going to come back. Now, let me give you actually two books you can read. N.T. Wright writes a book called Surprised by Hope. Both of these books are some, somewhat thick, but they're powerful. Um, N.T. writes a book called uh, It's Surprised by Hope, and he goes through this whole journey of, of what we can anticipate. The second is Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, and it, it is probably one of the better uh, theological understandings of, of what heaven is like and where we go when we die and such, and I recommend those two books to you. So as Christians... We believe that Christ is going to return. And what we see in the book of Revelation at the end, in chapters 21 and 22, is that his return, and this is where I think sometimes we get, this is my perspective, I think where we get confused. We look at his return as us going up there rather than him coming down here. Jesus is returning. And he is going to make a new creation. New, we, we hear new, the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven. So in some ways, move slowly for the camera that's moving. Isn't it? So we're at this threshold, and, and we're going, the person's going to be in the presence of Jesus, but Jesus is going to return. The dead will rise. And we get this idea when we read Revelations 22 that earth is renewed like the Garden of Eden. And things are restored. It's as if we were meant to be. As, as we were meant to be in creation. Now, I want to say it again. What is beyond is both assured and it's a mystery. And the struggle that we face is, you know, like mysteries... I'm a little control freak. How about you? I'd like to have it all detailed out for me. I remember, I remember when um, I had my first time I ever went to Disneyland. Um, I was probably 8 to 10 years old. I was a little kid going with my parents. And uh, we drove from Petaluma, California to Bakersfield, California, because that's where my favorite cousins lived, and we were all going to go together. And then we got in our cars, and we made our way to Anaheim. And those miles between Bakersfield, California, and Anaheim were filled with the sense of anticipation. I couldn't wait. What was the greatest place on earth going to be like? 
When we got to the hotel, my heart was exploding, wanting to see and experience it. And I remember being in the car when I first saw it, and I thought to myself, I'm here. This is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> At Christmas time, my kids would open, I've wanted this all my life, they would say. It's kind of how I felt in that moment. Here's the thing. I had no idea what it was like, but only perceptions in my mind. But when I saw it and when I experienced it, well, I'm over 50 years older from that time, and I still want to go back again. <laughs> when it comes to death, our hope should be greater than our fear. Our hope should be greater than our fear. Now, let me clarify something. Because we could take this wrong. I am, not, I am not somehow promoting suicide, you know. Life's not good. I'm just going to expedite myself onto the other side. That is not the case. That is not the Apostle Paul saying that. Matter of fact, Paul says, I have a mission here. And yeah, do I have this longing, a desire that I'd love to be in the very presence of Jesus? Absolutely. But I have a mission here, and he's called me to be here and to present the gospel. And if you read the book of Philippians, you'll find out that Paul says, I've got a mission to be a part of, and I'm staying here until it's time in which Christ calls me home. So now what? What does this mean for me today? Well, the hope we have for eternity the hope we have for beyond the threshold should focus our lives for today. Listen to the next statement of Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. So, 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 kind of give it a therefore, right? So if this is the stuff that's going on, if absent body be present with the Lord, and I know that there's hope beyond this threshold, so, therefore, we make it our goal to please him. Whether we are at home in the body or whether we're away from it. I have, I have, uh, I've experienced in my journey as a pastor that there are people, Christians, who are so committed on to look to this side of the threshold that they don't do anything on this side of the threshold, you know? So heavenly minded, they're no earthly good, okay? But I've also seen Christians who are so earthly-minded, they're not putting a perspective on the sense of eternity. And so I want to remind us as we sit on this side of the threshold that eternity began the moment you received Jesus because you've entered into relationship with him. That's going to go on for all eternity. Eternity began the moment you received Jesus. Eternity is not a threshold to be crossed when we die. It's a reality that we're to be living into today. And we live into that when we love our neighbor. We live into that when we love our enemies. We live into that when we, we uh, pray for those who persecute us. We live into that. Jesus called it being kingdom of God people. We, we are part of the kingdom of God. We, he reigns in our lives. Yes, there are other kingdoms around us, kingdoms that are, that are broken and a mess, and we're called to live into that as followers of Jesus and let them see something different in our lives so that they get a glimpse of the kind of hope and the love and the joy that he has for us. So what we believe about eternity will or should affect how we live today. The resurrection of Christ, the idea of eternity, is not about avoiding death. It's, it's not about avoiding hell. And by the way, I haven't said anything about that. That's a whole different subject. Want to stick around for a little longer? I didn't say anything about that. I want us to understand, and I, and I got to tell you, I, because I came to Christ out of the fear of death, I would have said mine was more about avoiding hell than it was about what I'm about to tell you. It's about a relationship with Jesus. It's about knowing that he's got the best interest in mind, and I want that relationship to begin today and go all the way into eternity. So let me ask you this morning. It's a question I've had to ask myself in this. 
What are you longing for? Did you, did you hear Paul talk about I'm, I'm groaning, I anticipate, I wait for. What are you longing for? What does that look like? Well, Nancy and I had our first camping trip about 35 plus years ago. Um, I was in seminary in Kansas City, and uh, we drove from Kansas City to Estes Park, Colorado, and we set up our little three-man tent. Do you know how um, when you set up your three-man tent, they, that, yeah, three is a lie. That, that's just a lie. Hey, three people aren't fitting in that thing. I don't know what three people it is, but we set up our three-person tent, and, and we were so excited about that. We were camping. We looked forward to campfires. We were going to roast marshmallows and have s'mores. We were even going to enjoy a good hot dog because we were young and we didn't really care about our health. Each evening, we would go downtown, and we would walk the boulevard, and we didn't have much money, but we'd buy ice cream, and we would eat that, and we were holding hands because we were deeply in love. We still do that today. We were holding hands because we were deeply in love. We were just relaxing. It was time away from school and work. It was great camping. I don't know if you've ever been to Estes Park, Colorado. But it's as if at 4.30 in the afternoon, every afternoon, there's a cloudburst. It only lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. But during that time, you think your tent is going to float down Main Street. And I find myself, we we, we began to, as we were going to leave for the day, to make sure we scooted everything to the center of the tent. Because what happens when your stuff touches the edge of the tent when it's raining? What does it do? Gets all wet. It's not any fun. And then that week, there was a full moon. Have you ever tried to sleep in a tent with a full moon? It's like this bright nightlight that stays on the whole time. There were showers. They were nice. But, but after you take a shower, you've got you to set your towel on the tent, hoping the sun will hit it, so it dries. Did I tell you what happens at 4.30 every afternoon? (laughs) And then there are pit toilets. Is enough said right there? Does that give you? And do you know how cold it gets in Colorado? Granted, we're newly married. But my wife hates to cuddle. We have a king-size bed on purpose. It's interesting to me. After four or five days of sleeping in a tent on the ground with a small little pad underneath your sleeping bag, you're kind of ready to go home. You know what I'm saying? You long for it. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, I've heard some of you say this. You could probably finish this sentence. Whether you've been in a tent or an RV, you arrive back home and you say to yourself, I can't wait to get back into my own bed. Yeah, man, you got it. Back into your own bed. Can't wait to sleep in my own bed. That's kind of the longing of the Apostles Paul's heart. We live in this tent. And it's wearing out. And I enjoy the tent. I enjoy everything that comes with it. All the s'mores and hot dogs and all the stuff. But there's an end that's coming. And, and we anticipate what will it be to experience his love in its fullness. Apostle Paul said we see in a mirror dimly, but someday we will see face to face. It's a mystery. But it's a mystery that's assured. What today are you longing for in your heart? May your longings give you hope and give you a vision of how to live today. Would you stand with me in closing? Hmm. God, I'm, uh, I admit that I would sure like to have all the questions of my mystery to the mystery um, clearly understood clearly defined what I do know is this 
God, you love us. And you created us for eternity. You created us to be in relationship with you. And your desire is to bring this brokenness together with your peace and restore things new. Help us to live into that relationship with you every day. Help us to know that we're tasting a little bit of heaven right now. Knowing that we have experienced your grace and forgiveness, your hope and your joy. Thanks for the confidence we can place that this is not the end. Well, I hope that was a helpful and a meaningful message for you today. And if you would like to speak with anyone about the message or about anything going on in your life, we would love to connect with you. And there are many ways that you can do that. To connect with us, you can send us a message through our website, OntarioFirst.org. We'd also love to have you like us on Facebook or, or send us a message through Facebook Messenger. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Ontario Nazarene. We'd also like to invite you today to subscribe to this channel by hitting the big red subscribe button. And then click on the bell next to it so that you'll get notified whenever we upload a new video. And as always, we are right here every Sunday morning for worship service at 9.30 and 11 o'clock a.m., both in person and online. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you've enjoyed your time with us. And we do hope to see you again real soon.